Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session. Um, I'll be talking about the current state of web integration testing. We'll see what is web integration testing exactly, which practices it covers, how you could do it today, the limitations you'd probably face trying to do so, and how we should all be doing it in the future. My name is uh, Mathis Schneider. The content in this presentation is based on five months of research and development I did on this topic last year, full-time. So that was two months of full-time research and then three months of developing uh, a testing framework that uh, we'll be talking shortly uh, afterwards that basically aimed at going beyond the limitations that were shared by um, all the tools that were available at the time. This presentation is also based on experience I gained during my last months where I've been working at Mesh, a startup developing a web application targeting surgery services. So in this context, you'll understand that our web application's quality is not only a matter of customer satisfaction. It's actually going to be a critical tool used by medical professionals every day. Um, please note that I'll be mostly taking the point of view of a developer, as that's what I'm mostly. Um, so if you're a professional tester, uh, I'll be very glad to hear your feedback about what this means for you. Um, so that's where I'm talking from today. We'll start by making sure that we have a common language, that we share a common vocabulary. Um, indeed, if you read a bit about the subject on the internet, you might have noticed that the terminology depends quite a lot on the author, either, either of the articles or the frameworks. So, the classical testi testing literature usually um, discerns three levels of testing. The first one, the one that is, that is closest to the code, is unit testing. It's concerned with testing the smallest pieces of code that contain business logic. Usually that's methods or functions, and in the context of web applications, um, the tested units may reside either on the server or on the client side. Now, anyway, if you're serious about quality, you should be testing on both sides. The level above is functional testing. Uh, it's a bit fuzzier. It's about testing parts of your program that implement independent features. The exact part and its size depend on the architecture, the environment, the size of the whole system. So it may be classes, it may be modules made of several classes, or it could even be whole parts of distributed architectures. Um, in the context of web applications, uh, a good example might be a JSON endpoint on your server or a part of your object model uh, on your front side. The final level uh, is integration testing. It's the level in which all the individual software modules that were tested individually are tested as a group. Um, it also means that they are tested through, through the same access means as your final users will. Um, in the context of web applications, that means testing the results of combining all your client-side code and all your server-side code, so that's your whole web application, and accessing it through a browser. I was saying earlier that there were many synonyms uh, for this kind of testing, and indeed, um, I think that's a major problem against uh, the adoption of such practices, that depending on the author, you might have this re being referred to functional testing, um, so, there's an ambiguity uh, with what I was presenting uh, earlier, the level beneath. Frankly, I don't know if there's any absolute term you should be using, but um, at least you can rest assured that during this presentation I will be talking about integration testing and only this. Um, but if you read later on some literature that refers to functional testing and it seems to be the same thing, it definitely might be. Um, customer testing and end-to-end testing are also synonyms that are a bit older, but if you read all the literature, you may definitely find them. Um, system testing usually includes data, while integration testing is mostly concerned about logic. And validation and acceptance testing are usually done by your client, instead of the development team itself. Okay, we've seen many different synonyms for the same reality. Let's have an example of that, what this reality looks like. So here's uh, an automated uh, web integration testing framework. We're uh, loading a suit. Um, an example suit. Uh, a browser will be started up automatically. Uh, the web page, the targeted web page, will be loaded. Uh, then some text is included in the text field. Uh, a button is clicked, just like a real user would. Then the resulting information uh, is checked against some values that were described in the test suit. So, very simple example, just to make sure that we have a common understanding of what web integration testing is when it's automated. So now that we have the same term, uh, let's make sure that we also um, share the aims for such testing. 
First of all, we are concerned about testing the presence of functionalities, features that add customer value. We are also concerned about the behavior of such functionalities. We want to make sure that given a certain set of inputs, certain navigation paths, um, our application will present our final users with the expected outputs. Finally, in the context of web applications, you know that we are fighting against one great evil, and that is that forms discrepancies. So we're not only concerned about functionalities being there, behaving properly, we're also concerned about those functionalities behaving properly across all browsers and devices our users might use. Now, all of this is fine, but how do we actually do this? Um, as I was saying earlier, I think an important problem against adoption is that the language is not always very clear. Um, and actually, the tool stack itself is not very clear. Um, so we'll see a bit of the history of the tool we are currently using to automate browsers so that we can better understand it. You have your great web application. It delivers great functionality and everyone's happy about it. The thing is, you're about to deliver and now you want to make sure it works in all the browsers your users could use to get access to this great web application. Not only do you want to test against all browsers, you want to test against all the versions of said browsers your users could use. Man, that's a lot of browsers. Luckily, there's one thing software engineers are really good at, and that's adding abstraction. So, instead of writing automated tests for every single browser, which would probably take more time than simply testing and then browsers manually, you will write your tests in an abstract browser controller and it will simply target um, the browser you're interested in testing in. Well, back in 2004, 2005, two tools went this way, Sahi and Selenium. We'll mostly be focused on Selenium during this presentation. Sahi seems to be a good tool. Um, it has an open source component, but it's mostly a commercial tool targeting professional QA teams. So if that's you, if your company has enough resources to allocate uh, a full-time QA team, then it might definitely be a tool you want to look into. Um, but here I will be considering mostly a development team uh, which is interested in automating its test suite. So at that time, uh, Selenium was created and it was um, mostly a Java component. Java was really sexy at the time. Uh, but other languages started getting used for web projects too. And teams, of course, wanted tools in the language they knew. They didn't want to have one language for their application and one language for their testing. Then, what could we do? Add another layer of abstraction, of course. So, instead of writing your tests directly in Java, you would write your tests in the language you wanted, which would then be bound to the Selenium API, which would then communicate with the browsers you wanted to automate and so on. Well, how would it communicate with the set browsers? It would inject a JavaScript library in every single browser which would be able to trigger simulated user events, such as clicking, entering text, and so on. But over time, uh, JavaScript raised security concerns. <coughs> and over time, the differences between the native events, actual clicks, and the simulated events started getting bigger. So you couldn't really automate exactly as you could earlier the different browsers. And automation started getting limited. Luckily, every single browser could be automated in its own way. For example, Firefox exposes an automation API, i.e. is automatable through the Windows services uh, of accessibility, for example. So, all browsers could be automated, but you were back again with testing for each browser. So, what could we do with this stack and different browsers with different drivers? Add a layer of abstraction. Now you can write your tests in the language you want, it would communicate over HTTP with the Selenium server, and then it would send instructions to drivers, which would then send instructions to your browsers. So that was back in 2009, uh, when the Selenium project, JavaScript library, JavaScript remote control, and the web driver project were merged, um, giving birth to Selenium 2. So usually today, if you're reading articles about Selenium, actually we're talking about Selenium 2, that's now Selenium, and if you read about WebDriver, that's also Selenium. So once again, it's a bit difficult when you're reading articles for the first time. Usually it all refers to the same thing. So now we have a great stack for automation, 
But even though Selenium has this little checkbox in its logo, it's only a browser automation tool. It's not a testing tool. So every single time you wanted to do testing and not pure automation, you would have to write your helper libraries. Of course, everyone would be doing it again and again. So what did we do? You know it. We just added some abstraction over all that stuff. And now you would write, you would use a testing framework that would use the bindings for Selenium, etc., 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 through the browser. Great! Well, now everyone could be testing in every single browser in the language of his choice. Then the second great browser's arms race started, and updates to the browsers became much more frequent. So, what happens if, for example, Firefox, one browser, in the end of the stack, gets updated and breaks compatibility with one of the features that are implemented on the other side of the stack? That's when you start realizing that abstraction is cool, but can also be really slow and heavy and kind of ugly altogether. So developers did the second thing they do best, restart from scratch. <laughs> About two years ago, um, Aria Hidayat created PhantomJS, as you might have read about. PhantomJS is a headless WebKit. So headless, that's hence the name, right? Um, Headless means that it's a command line tool, you start. Uh, it starts the whole rendering engine of WebKit, but it doesn't show any graphical user interface. Of course, um, interacting with a browser that doesn't have an interface is not really easy, which is why PhantomJS is the headless WebKit, plus a JavaScript API, that's the JS, to control the headless WebKit. So now we have this very simple, very fast uh, automation stack uh, and it's written in JavaScript, and that's really nice because all the cool kids write code in JavaScript. But that was still for automation only. What if you want to do testing? Well, you would, you would write your tests, but very soon we wanted to do always the same thing, so Nicolas Perio created Casper.js, a JavaScript library that would communicate with the Phantom JavaScript library, which would then automate the headless WebKit. Great, we are now able to do integration testing with this stack, which is really fast. Are we? No, at this point there's something really important you have to um, get from this session. More and more articles talk about doing integration testing with PhantomJS. PhantomJS is fast, it's really nice for developers, it doesn't start browsers all over your development machine, but are you doing integration testing? Well, if your browsers if your users, sorry, are accessing your web application through PhantomJS, through a headless browser, then yeah, you're doing integration testing. But your users are probably not, uh, not seeing your web application. So if you want to do web integration testing, you cannot rely on Phantom. Because the WebKit engine is not the same as all the other engines. Not only is it not the same as the rendering engine of Firefox, for example, it's not even the same WebKit that is used in Safari, and even if it was the same, the JavaScript engine is different, and we've experienced firsthand that tests that pass under Phantom might break in an actual browser or the other way around. So this is very powerful, but this is not actual integration testing. This is more of something like smoke testing, making sure your web application loads and that it interacts properly, but it cannot be considered actual integration. Nevertheless, the tool is very attractive to developers, and they started realizing that this was only for WebKit engines, so that's a bit annoying if your users are using Firefox, for example. So what happened? Well, last month, <laughs> Laurent Joanneau created Slimer.js, a JavaScript library that aims to do the exact same thing as Phantom using the same uh, JavaScript API, but for Gecko, the rendering engine of Firefox. Great, now we can automate browsers in JavaScript, both WebKit and Gecko. Now, if it starts reminding you of the previous ugly jellyfish we had, it might not be an entire coincidence. Uh, at some point, you have to understand that browsers are different. There are different ways to automate them, and still we want to write against all of them. So you will always need adapters all around. And to make this even more complicated, uh, last year, Ivan de Marino created an adapter so that you could write your tests in Selenium and communicate with Phantom. So all of that is getting pretty powerful, but really messy also. 
Now, you have understood that the problem with this tool stack is not its power, it is complexity. Luckily, there are solutions. Software solutions such as Capybara, uh, which is packaged as a Ruby gem, uh, bundles all the, the different elements of, your, of this automation and testing stack so that you simply install Capybara and everything is handled for you. Capybara also integrates Cucumber. So, why do I talk about Cucumber? Because so many people will tell you, yes, I'm doing web integration testing with Cucumber. No, you're not doing web integration testing with Cucumber. Cucumber is a BDD framework. So what is that? A BDD framework is simply a tool that will convert uh, feature descriptions written in pseudo-English, a language called Gherkin, which has a given when, then, uh, and will convert this to testing code. But this testing code could be absolutely anything and also have nothing to do with web at all. If indeed in your testing code you're using water, the Ruby library that binds to C, and so on, then indeed you're doing browser automation and in the end you're using Cucumber to do web integration testing. But it is only a very small part in the whole stack. So the next time you read an article about using Cucumber for doing web, web integration testing, remember it's only one way to write the tests, nothing more. Uh, an alternative to Capybara is the intern, uh, released a few months ago. The idea is let the testing be made by the intern. Uh, so, really nice motto. Once again, it's a big piece of glue. It packages uh, all the different pieces of the stack, but this time it's written for JavaScript, so you would write your automated tests in JavaScript. The cool thing is that it can also dispatch all your unit tests written for your front end across all the different browsers you're targeting. And you can get a result in a grid telling you if your test passed or not against all the different browsers, plus integration tests. So there are solutions against, to, against our stack complexity. However, here's when it gets worse. Uh, testing on all browsers is mandatory, and that's done by automating the browsers. But it also means that to be able to test them, you have to somehow get access to those browsers. And that's where it gets worse. It's because beyond the stack, the execution environment also plays a role. The easiest way to do uh, integration testing is to do it locally. You would have the browsers that are installed on your machine. You would simply have to plug in all the drivers, the Selenium drivers that are needed for each of those browsers, add the Java archive that contains the Selenium server, and then start it up on a local port. Then you simply aim your testing framework at the URL that is local, and it would start up the browsers on your development machine and automate, it, and automate them all as wanted. Nice, but we're limited, limit, we're, but we're limited by, by at least one thing, which is our operating system. With this setup, you cannot test Safari, for example, on something else than OSM, nor can you test IE under something else than Windows. Plus, browsers do not always behave exactly the same from one platform to the other, so Firefox on Linux is not exactly the same as Firefox on Windows, as we have experienced firsthand. So, let's go back to the, yeah, you do abstraction part. You can use virtual machines and using virtual machines, you can have as many browser platform combinations you want. But that will quickly bring your computer to its knees, having all those different operating systems loaded all together. So you probably need servers to externalize all those virtual machines. And then you have to maintain your own infrastructure, and then it ends up costing you more than testing manually. So once again, it depends on your size. If you have, if you have enough uh, resources, to have a full QA of a dedicated infrastructure team, then it might be worth it. Otherwise, you might be better off checking hosted continuous integration services. Really, the duration of uh, automated browser tests uh, really indicate them for continuous integration. And hosted continuous integration is a really great thing. Many services will provide you with a Selenium server and drivers and the latest browsers all out of, all out of the box. For example, we're using CircleCI, it works really well, and every code push, all our tests are run, including uh, browser tests. However, you're still limited to the operating system your tests are running in, usually that's a Linux box, and you can't control the stack. 
So, I said you got the latest browsers. Yes, you get the latest browsers, always. Even when it's two days before you're releasing and updating the browser means updating the driver, means breaking all your tests, and you have no visibility at all anymore. So, um, continuous integration is really nice. It's a good way to start with the browser tests, but at some point you will always be um, caught by the fact that there's a problem with reliability. And as you know, unstable tests are actually worse than no tests at all, because it leads you to false confidence or to ignore actual failures. In both cases, it's terrible. Um, reliability depends on the environment, and it is one of the pains of web integration testing. Well, luckily, once again, there's a solution. And this solution is called SoSnaps. It's a startup that does exactly, very simply, maintaining virtual machines for you with all the operating system and browser combinations. They are all created on demand and available over the internet through a Selenium endpoint. Uh, very importantly, they also offer a very simple to set up tunnel between their testing infra infrastructure and your local machine, which means that you can test a locally deployed application without needing to deploy it to the internet, even though the tests are run over the internet. So, this problem is kind of solved too. Now, we've seen the concepts, we've seen the environments, and we've seen some tools that seem to be doing the work. Uh, now, let's have a quick look at how you would actually write tests with such a stack. I've mentioned two tools, intern, capybara. Now, this is an example of code. I don't want you to read through that code in much details. Let's simply have a quick look at the structure. It's about getting a new URL. It's about walking the DOM to get access to one particular element. It's about sending click events. It's about sending keystrokes. It's about getting HTML attributes and doing some assertions against them. It's about, it's about the old web. It's about the web of websites, not the web of web applications. If you're developing a web application with a serious front end nowadays, you're not thinking about walking the DOM. You're not thinking about HTML attributes. You're thinking about components and APIs and object models. Um, now, I don't mean to diminish the tools um, I've cited. They do great work. But the thing is, the way to write the tests are not in phase with the current state of web development. And as long as the testing tools are stuck behind like this, well, testing will be painful. I mean, do you really want to be walking the DOM in your testing code while you can simply instantiate components in your application code. It doesn't make any sense. You never do that in unit testing. You use the same libraries. Um, and it forces you to do white box testing. And there are many bad things that have, can happen with this. So this is really the current state of web integration testing. Now, I'd like today to start a conversation about how we could do it in the future. I've thought about it, and one proposal could be to separate and architecture our tests in, for example, this way. What about modeling all the components we're using in our front end so that we can automate them easily? What about then simply writing scenarios that describe how all those components are supposed to be interacting and separate all that from the data that we are testing against? Um, let's see an example of how such a software, uh, how, how a software could implement such an architecture. So you might remember that at the beginning we saw a test which loaded up a search engine, typed in some text, clicked the search button, and then found the result pages. Let's see how such a test could be implemented. We'll start by describing the components our test is going to interact with. So that's our search bar with the different elements. We describe what is the basic action we can do with such a component, searching for a term. And then we have another component, which is the info box that is shown in the results page. Then our scenario is simply a description of what the expected feature is and how, all the, how the two widgets we've described earlier are supposed to interact. First we'll search then we'll describe what the expected state of the components is. Finally, 
there is one piece of data that is depending on what we want to achieve, and that's the term we're going to look up. Well, the syntax in which those tests are written is the syntax of the tool I'm currently developing. So that's this tool, Watai, uh, aims to implement such an architecture. Now, I won't lie to you. Um, I don't think the tool is mature enough to be deployed everywhere. We've been using it in production for the last 11 months, and we're happier and happier about it. But at the same time, it's also easier for us to fix as um, I am directly in the team. So I think it might be worth checking it out. Uh, it's definitely worth thinking altogether as a community about what we could do with such tools. Is it really what we should be doing in the future? The vision would be that every web component delivered includes its automation description. You can view this as delivering a human API specification. Just like components are expected to have unit tests to check their developer API. This would allow black box testing of web applications uh, just like we do for other levels of testing. Even if your web application is made of combining components you found around the web. So let's recap what we've seen today. We've seen what is web integration testing. It's about simulating user interaction through the same access means are your actual users will. It can be done manually, but that's very costly. We want to automate it. There are ways to automate it. We have a tool that is, we have a stack that is stable, but it's also ugly. Um, however, there's no real way to get away from the fact that we want to abstract away the browser differences and the language in which we're writing the tests. Luckily, there are tools that bundle all the stacks so that you don't have to maintain it yourself. You will have to find the one that is the most suited for your particular language, framework, and methodology. We've also seen that the environment plays an important role in the reliability of your tests, and that maintaining your own lab is costly, running tests is slow. And the best solution today is probably to run smoke tests locally on whichever browser is available on your development machine, possibly headless browsers, so that it's faster, and then delegate the actual testing over all the target browsers to a hosted continuous integration tool. Finally, we've seen that all current popular frameworks have a common weakness. They are not built for the modern web. And the alternative solutions are still under development. So that's one part where we still have to look at the future for solutions. So what's on your to-do list if you want to start writing automated web tests uh, on Monday when you're back to work? Well, first of all, become familiar with the concept. Now, if I, have, if I have done my job well today, you might take that one off. Then, try the tools that are available. Uh, frankly, there's no way to uh, direct you to one specific tool today. Um, you will have to find the one that is suited for you. Then, evaluate, based on your testing, the return on investment. Uh, basically, the idea is to assess if regression costs are higher than the costs of inserting a new testing tool and a new testing platform in your development. And finally, since all this is still um, very evolving and very living, please participate in the community. Let us all have this important dialogue of how we can finally achieve high quality on the web today. Thanks for your attention.